Good afternoon for those of you here in Hawaii. Good evening, other places or good morning, wherever you may be. Thanks so much for joining us for this group's first session of 2022. We're venturing to step forward into a year that we hope will be better than the last two. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about where those questions and concerns are and, and what might help us go in better directions this year. We have an all-star group um, for no particular reason other than chance. I'm gonna start with Louise Ng because she's the recent winner of the Daniel Anoe Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. And that's a, that's a really huge, important focal group and a very influential one. And so this is, this is an award that takes on a national and international significance and recognition, which is especially impressive because Louise, in my experience of knowing her for most of her years, has flown under the radar screen with community service, with women's rights, with lots of areas. The same is true for Tina Patterson, won a number of awards last year. I, I lost track of the names of all of them, so I'm not, not gonna try and recite them all. But we have four award winners here. Rebecca Radliff also gathered a handful of awards over this past year. And that's especially impressive in times where people's disconnections and frustrations and the things that weren't coming together greatly outnumbered those that did. So recognition for positive achievement. And Sandra Sims, our noted author, former judge, community service leader. I mean, this is just, this is an amazing group of people. But I did wanna take a little time to honor each and all of them for the immeasurably valuable insights, experiences, and perspectives that each and all bring to the table. So recognizing that, where do you folks think we're headed in 2022? Sandra, let's start with you. Wherever we're headed is better than where we've been. Um, <laughs> that's, the, that's how I can see things at this point, uh, the last uh, you know, a couple of years, I think we've all just been on this incredible uh, roller coaster of, of events and, and uh, COVID up, pushed back and going forward and pushing back to the, and the impacts that it's had on so many aspects of our, uh, of our society, healthcare, uh, the economy, um, jobs, all of those things have been affected by the last few years. So I think that at this point, uh, whatever we're doing is definitely going to head to at least to me, and I'm, I'm beginning to feel that, um, is far better than, well, maybe not far, but certainly in a different direction than where we've been. Um, and, and I continue to feel you know, optimistic about that, despite some of the things that are occurring. And it feels like uh, we're doing the same things over, but then there's a part of me that says, no, we're not. It is different. It is different. Things have changed. So I think I'm okay. <laughs> That's encouraging. I think Rebecca? I'm okay. I understand that. I, I, I feel the same way. I'm an internal optimist. And no matter what I see, I believe that things can always be better because I really do believe in, in the human spirit. Um, and I believe that most people are good um, at their core. They're more good people than not. And um, I agree with you, Sandra, um, the, the instability of jobs, housing, education, food instability, uh, health care, physical and um, um, mental uh, health care, uh, lacking in underserved communities, um, and the civil unrest in our country has been very unsettling on top of this pandemic that, that uh, we're all getting through all over the world, which is obviously the, uh, the meaning of pandemic, which we now are hearing is endemic. Um, 
I talked to a, a friend of mine uh, yesterday. I got to see my friend, the virologist and infectious disease doctor, uh, Dr. Lane Rowling, who has been on MSNBC um, and uh, Black News Channel. And, and he said that Omicron is the next, is the new flu. So maybe that's what flu Rona is. Um, but we, you know, we are just steadily navigating these menaces, um, you know, all over the world. And it's just, it's just been really hard. And so I agree with you. We've got to look forward to better days and let's all be part of that. Right. Tina, what do you think? I could take the easy out and say it's already been covered by Sandra and Rebecca, but I, I, I'll, I'll add addition to that. I, I think we are, um, we're one step closer as an organism, and I'm thinking society, as it's at a societal level, um, to shift conversations that we began in 2020 and 2021 are, are starting to take shape. They're taking root. Um, I received an email a, a few days ago regarding um, a, a day of a day of racial healing, which if you had asked me five years ago, I probably would not have received. And it's, it's, it is a global effort. So I, I see um, people talking less about going back to normal, but talking about what the new normal is. So um, there's, there's hope, there's, there's some sense of optimism. And I would be remiss if I didn't say in the midst of all of that, um, some dying away of, of what's not working and recognizing it. Um, and can we do that in a peaceful manner or does it have to be um, unsettling and chaotic? Louise? What's your sense? Well, um, I have to join my fellow panelists in holding out hope because if I look at the daily news and listen to the daily news reports, it can be so maddening and frustrating, um, you know, as Rebecca points out, just the social inequities we've been seeing that have been exacerbated by the pandemic and then the divisions in our country and, and just the, um, you know, the persistent I guess, uh, you know, the, the politicization of, of, of the coronavirus, which, you know, I have seen directly with the impact on friends, how that just affects so many people who tried to do the right thing, and, you know, had to die alone, for instance, because they wouldn't let visitors into the hospital or, you know, things like that. But I have to, you know, I guess I have to, I think we all have to keep going by looking on the bright side and seeing how that, how we can, bring our networks and um, communities together to make positive difference instead of getting wallowing in just the, the bad stuff going on. And I think some bright spots for me were actually early December, um, Sandra was there, but yes. we had a table of eight women at the uh, Ho'olanapua dinner. And that's an organization that um, helps girls who have been sexually abused and trafficked and um, it was a all ages. It's ranged from Miss Hawaii going off to Miss America pageant to us with gray hair and someone, um, you know, a General Susie Barislam, who's coming oh. in as the first AAPI women president of East West Center. And it was such a wonderful, you know, conversation and support network. I think we need to depend on things like that. I think um, Miss Hawaii went off just feeling more supported and empowered by the women there. And I think we all did that, you know, there's a great next generation that's coming up. Um, and uh, yeah, that, it, that was wonderful. And I think the, the other high point recently was that we had a CEO search going on in our firm for our U.S., all our U.S. offices. And now we have a, our first woman CEO, who's also an LGBT advocate, and um, and her COO is a woman lawyer too. And so the women are firmly in charge, and um, I just think that that's a real message for the diver you know diversification in our firm, and just a, you know that these are champions that will really make sure that diversity and inclusion are baked into our culture too. So happy about those things. Yeah. And what a great opportunity to have four truly exemplary women leaders who have experienced uh, some things that would probably be insurmountable for a lot of people. 
that I'll, I'll bet every one of you has multiple times. And, and to look at a pandemic that has accelerated and accentuated from a health pandemic to pandemics in almost every other sector of society, housing, employment, environment, climate, everything. And to look at that and to focus as you did so eloquently, Tina, that our humanity is in our commonality as an organism, not in our division in organizations. What an amazing perception, one characteristic of the experience and perspective of women leaders. Where are the places where you most look for hope as we move forward MLK Day, Martin Luther King Day in this country. Where are the places where you most look for hope and for that organism of humanity to maybe start to regenerate and bloom and come together? Atlanta, of course, was of course the birthplace yes. of Dr. King. Yes. I wrote I wrote MLK and then you said it. Um, so as, as usual, we're all in sync. Um, but the King family has asked that um, in these in the suburbs and in the city that we not do the traditional parades, but instead um, that organizations stand together um, in protest of the, the voting, um, the new voting legislation and um, you know, the, the, the civil inequities that are going on um, around Atlanta and the state. And um, and so again, I thought I did. I thought it was brilliant, Tina, the way you um, brought that together. We had all had uh, our 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 take, and then you and then you brought it together just uh, so eloquently. Um, hope, but action. There there has to, to be action. We have to stick together. We have to strategize, and we can't let up. We have to do the things, say the things, and be in the places where um, action can make impact. Hey, Thanks so much. I see the wheels turning for each of you. Uh, Sandra, what were you thinking about as Rebecca was? Talking? I was thinking, you know, I, I was thinking, I, cause I wanted to hear what Rebecca had to share, particularly, you know, coming from a place that is a center of where we look at the impact of Martin Luther King's life. And of course, we're having that here as, as, as well. I think the uh, president of our local NAACP has called for a day in, devoted to doing some service projects. And he's listed some of those that people can engage in as a way of recognizing um, this, this legacy. We're this, you know, having to uh, come back and still talk about voting rights though, is troubling. Um, it's troubling and I'm, I'm I'm hopeful that when we make this focal point on voting rights again and making certain that those voting rights are not taken away, I think when we've seen all so much of the um, the rhetoric and, and argument regarding this election, this past election, and so many of the falsities and some of the lies that have come up about that, that are actually becoming ingrained in some sectors of the society, making it more imperative that we continue with this uh, push on voting rights. I think that's going to be really, really important. Um, but I also think that because of this group, I think so many, each of us is, you know, involved in our own sphere of, uh, you know, organizations. I know I'm very active with, um, you know, with Lynx and with Seroptimus. All of those organizations are taking stances on, have always taken stances on these issues that are facing us. The African-American Lawyers Association, same thing. We just had a recent uh, visit with Keith Ellison um, and that was a program that we opened to the entire community. And he spoke about uh, the, role, the role of the prosecutor in, in the, uh, the Floyd case and his work process. And that was attended by you know, quite a few folks that are outside of the African-American Law Lawyers Society. We made it open. And that's still being, again, part of what we're doing to keep these issues in the forefront, to keep those discussions going. And I think what we're doing is, as you know, this group, you, you guys are, you're some, some amazing folks. I, I go back to that uh, dinner I had with Louise and that, oh my God, I, I'm still just kind of reveling in that 
time where we had women from various sectors, all engaged, all involved, all continually working to, you know, address these so many issues that we have from so many perspectives. And that is just so, that is encouraging. And I think that's kind of what we're continuing to do and be involved in. So yeah, yeah, Louise is actually quite amazing. <laughs> she, she really is. To bring that kind of a group together was, and we all sat there in amazement that we didn't all know each other, all of us before then. We did it. Not some of us did, some of us didn't. And we're all friends. And that's an important reference to Keith Ellison, for those viewers who aren't aware, he is the African-American attorney general of the state of okay, Minnesota, so, who yeah. personally single-handedly took the leadership in the investigation, development, and prosecution of the Chauvin George Floyd murder case and shepherded it in ways that he took great pains to describe with fantastic attention to detail and thoroughness and accuracy and truth to a successful conclusion that was based on getting all the truth out there, not just pieces of it, but enough of it to overcome mm -hmm. the innuendo, the disinformation, the other things that continue to work in some areas as we've seen with some other recent trials, unfortunately. Um, so Tina, where do we go from here that looks constructive and helpful to you? I was kind of hoping you'd call on Louise so I could follow <laughs> up after her. Uh, um, where do I look? I'm looking at two areas. I'm looking at service um, and, and we've all mentioned it, but it's the service that we, uh, that we see organizationally, whether it's our Optimus, the links. Um, I know today that there's um, historically um, African-American fraternities and sororities right. that have been involved in getting the word out regarding voting, but I, I'm, I'm gonna take it on a, an even more micro level. Um, I know in my jurisdiction, we were concerned about making sure that people had access to COVID tests, um, at home COVID tests, because pharmacies were saying they did not have, have them. And so we went to one of my favorite places, libraries. And so individuals who needed the, the home test could get the test at the library. They just needed wow. to come, take a, a maximum of two, two home tests with them. And some would say, well, um, it's just, two tests, but it's two tests that you probably would not have had, had access to. Um, and one site, within one day, 93,000 tests were gone. But I also think wow. my hope also lies with the scientific community. 18 months ago, 24 months ago, at-home tests didn't exist. And, and just seeing how the scientific community is advancing at a rate that I won't call it exponential, but it, it's it's moving so quickly that then the stories keep changing, the news keeps changing. In some ways, people find it laughable, but for me, it gives me hope that this is something that we know that people are working on around the clock. Um, so that as a colleague of mine who's a physician, she said, you know, Tina, there may be a day when COVID becomes like the common cold, and it's just something that you have, that your body will address it and gives me hope that we have leaders who are uh, are making this happen. And we have people who are voting with their choices. As, as one friend put it, he said, you know, Chuck, vaccinations are a vote too. And we are now approaching two thirds of the population that can get vaccinated Hey, getting themselves and their families vaccinated. Hey, and maybe because vaccination has been so politicized together with masks and testing and other things, hey, maybe that's a good sign that there is a groundswell at the human level, at the organism level, at the public health and safety level 
that notwithstanding a Supreme Court justice's refusal to wear a mask next to his colleagues, one of whom is with compromised immune system having diabetes and others compromised in other ways, that people are making choices even after they're politicized that reflect putting the collective well-being and health first. So Louise, where are you looking for change that might be good for us? Well, when you first mentioned that, and I guess um, like Tina and everybody, I'm looking at the macro and the micro level um, because we only have control over what's at the micro level. And I suppose, yeah, more community involvement. I think um, more support um, through donations or otherwise of community groups that are really helping to make a difference in families' lives. But also, um, you know, I, I'm getting constantly bombarded by political candidates, but I do think it is important for us to support our public servants who are trying to do the right thing. And on the micro, macro level, you know, voting rights, I'm glad the president finally is taking a more vocal stand on voting rights because it just seems to be such a, a critical factor in making a political difference in our country. And um, it's that, and um, maybe, you know, despite the, all the efforts to make people not be critical thinkers and not think about race theory and all of these other things, mm -hmm. we really need to be critical thinkers and teach our kids that because just reading the news is just too depressing. And, you know, exactly as Tina says, they, they pick up on all the, the bad things rather than kind of looking at the overall trends and where science is going and the progress we have made and, um, you know, the good things that are happening because of uh, the scientists, you know, trying to take a rational evidence-based approach to dealing with this virus. So those are my thoughts. And maybe that's a stronger and broader and deeper place to look for hope for 2022 and beyond is at that human community, even individual and family and small oh, group level. It's not going to come from our leadership in any of the sectors, whether it's legislative, judicial, executive, or otherwise. But the question is going to be whether the people they take back control of the important choices in this country. I think so. And the people. This is going to be a challenging year for that. It's going to have to be we the people. And as Louise and Tina were speaking, I was thinking about um, service here in Atlanta. We Among the, the yeah. Divine Nine sororities and fraternities, we say that King Day, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day is not a day off, but a day on. And and that it, that speaks to the service that we're committed to do as, as organization, at the organizational level. Um, but of course, it starts... Um, with the heart of a servant at the individual level. And, and um, that's, that's, that's how you get the organism that Tina is speaking of, is um, all of the different components that, that make up um, the people and the groups um, and the missions that, that those people and groups uh, will execute on. And that, that's how we'll make a difference. And so we just have to keep trying. And that's an important insight because coming back to where all of you had touched upon and, and Louise kind of crystallized for us. It, while it was Reverend King that was in the spotlight, we know that when he was taken unexpectedly and tragically from us, that the one who truly stepped up and brought things together and held them together was the one who had been doing that for years, who was Corinne, his widow, and still does. And she's still a beacon, a luminary, and more have risen up in all sectors. Sandra, you're a, a not, notable and noteworthy author. Isabel Wilkerson has become one of our most respected and most influential authors for good reason. And this is a yes. very art, 
well-educated young person who's got a lot of years of leadership ahead of her, as does Stacey Abrams. And look what she was able to do. Oh my God. People. Oh my goodness. She is, she is oh my goodness. Think about her, talking about a, a, a beacon. Yeah. <laughs> Talk oh about a beacon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's in your yeah. city or your state. Yes, I've had the pleasure of meeting her. Amazing. Oh. Just, mm. just oozing with. I was going to say the energy that comes. I mean, oh I'm my God. Her on, Regal. You know, on, oh. on, a, on television and that energy comes forth so clearly in so yes. many ways and there there's the there's the passion and there's the the commitment and of course it, she knows what she's doing she knows how to reach people she connects and okay. mobilize i'm sorry yeah. let me just calm down but she really does inspire me I'll tell you. <laughs> and i i commend to your her her fiction book her mystery while justice sleeps <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful book i just finished it yeah, um, yeah. And so I think you're right, Chuck. There's, the, you know, the what has happened as, as since those times that you've seen this emergence of these incredible um, young leaders. And so many women are among those leaders that are stepping forward. Yeah, we talked about one, but I, and I, and I, and there is in different spheres too. It isn't just limited to, you know, the areas of politics. You're seeing it in, you're seeing it in the arts. You're seeing it in, uh, in, in, in music. You're seeing it in so many spheres of our lives that we didn't always focus on during the civil rights era. But this, these are the, these are the, this, that part, when you talk about, you know, being hopeful, those are the things I think that are really, really going to make this difference as we move forward. Um, Everybody has their role. We just lost Sidney Poitier. And um, <laughs> what a lot of people didn't know about him was that, he and uh, I'm sure I don't know all the names, but um, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier were two people who stayed in the background and made money. Well, I mean, I've had the pleasure. I'm in Atlanta. So this is, you know, right. um, you know, civil rights history museum walking <laughs> around. But I, so I've had the pleasure of hearing um, Ambassador Andrew Young talk about how um, when Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier wanted to get involved in the civil rights uh, walks and everything, they were like, no, we need you to stay on the screen and to make money mm -hmm. because we're going to need you to help get some of these people out of jail. <laughs> and that's what they did. Yes, and that's exactly. what they did. And that's what they and did. That's what and they that's did. that's what they did. That's yes. right. Yes. People forget that sometimes, yep. you know, they were not just, they weren't just singing and <laughs> no. movies. They were, yeah. they had, they were role. helping to fund everyone had the a litigation. Role. That's right. Yeah, everyone that's has, everyone has a role. Yeah. yeah. I watched in the heat of the night this weekend, because just to look at it again, you know, from that perspective of, you know, with him being gone and what struck me was I didn't realize that movie was done in 1968 and that was not a time of, uh, you know, so much advancement as we are now. It was a very, and for him, and then watching him and watching Rob Reiner, um, not Rob Reiner, but anyway, watching them take, take the stances and act out the parts that they did in that time was so powerful. Oh, I mean, his role, he and, and Rod Steiger were just so powerful in those in that time that was such a critical time for that kind of expression was probably unheard of before that messaging and, and then the slap oh man the slap heard the around slap the world, heard around yeah. the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we didn't rehearse heard, that did we we didn't yeah. rehearse that sandra <laughs> I, I heard that wasn't even in the script that you know, yeah he insisted that he decided being, right yeah, yeah 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 and he insisted that if he was going to get slapped it had to go back the other way mm -hmm. and yeah. the moment was just and you think this happened in 1968 whoa this is what he stood for these are the things that you know that was how he insisted on being perceived um you know, as black men in a time when that was not something that was occurring everywhere. So, I'm I'm on a uh, you know Sydney Poitier movie watch this weekend. So I'm yeah. gonna be watching just to remember, you know, the stances that he took and 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 making certain that the way in which, you know, uh, we were portrayed was in a positive way, not. 
I think we need a Sidney Poitier f- film festival, just hearing the tributes to him in his movies. Yeah. Ooh, yeah Cantina and I come over for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Good idea because we're having to we had to postpone the African American Film Festival until uh, and that's this will be the tenth year actually last year was the tenth year we had to postpone it but that might be something to look at let me yeah tell you. Oh. we're doing I think in August this year uh, mm, so okay that would be a great body of great work. idea Louise I think mm-hmm. I'll mention that to Taylor and see what she thinks about it <laughs> yeah I like that especially since I can just walk there it's a block away but I have to. <laughs> I have to thank this panel for giving me my reading list. I mean, Heather Cox Richardson, she has such a way of putting things together. I keep wanting to send everybody her her thing, you know, her commentary. And then I did start listening to The Warmth of Other Suns. What an interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. book that is. Yeah. Fantastic. So we're out of time for today, but I, I wanted again just to thank all of you for bringing to the table exactly the courage, the character, the conscience, and the spirit that that we're all going to need to take 2022 where we needed to go to become that organic humanity that you folks have talked about and exemplified. Thank you all. Come back in a couple of weeks. Join us again. Thanks for your inspiration. Take good care.